Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. So you don't have to fear that you're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. And not only that, you'll never do enough. Jesus did enough. Number four, the fourth fear that we will talk about is fear that we're not doing enough. We took a survey in our office and asked them, I said, I'd like to know some things that people would really like to hear teaching on. So I said, what would be some of the main things you would like to hear teaching on? This was a few years back that we did this. And very interesting, I mean, there was a lot of interesting things, but the one thing that more people said than other things was, I want to know when I'm doing enough. And I thought that was really interesting. When am I praying enough? When am I reading enough scripture? When am I doing enough good works? When am I doing enough? I'm afraid I'm not doing enough. Do any of you go through that? Always thinking, or you have this vague fear. Or you have this little devil that sits on your shoulders. Well, what are you going to do? 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 And it throws us into a works of the flesh mode. You know, you need to pray till you're done. Don't pray by the clock. Don't let somebody come to your church or watch somebody on TV that gives you their testimony of how they pray five hours every morning and then you go try to do that because they do that. You're going to be one bored, miserable, <laughs> unhappy person. I tried that once. I announced to my family, I'm going to start praying four hours every day. We'd had an intercessor come to our church, and man, she had the power of God all over her. And I thought, whoo, glory to God, I want that. <laughs> well, the only problem was she was anointed to do that, and I wasn't. I prayed about everything I knew how to pray about two or three times and looked at my clock, and five minutes had gone by. <laughs> whoo. Lord have mercy. Well, I wasn't about to come out of the room, so I laid on the floor and took a nap. I call them prayer naps. You know, when you, when you go to pray and you fall asleep, that's what I call a prayer nap. And you know, then you wake up every once in a while, oh, Lord, I love you, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I have prayer naps all the time. <laughs> and then I heard all the teaching about, you know, can you not pray with me one hour? So then everybody in the whole world was trying to pray one hour a day. And it amazes me <laughs> the things that we come up with <laughs> that God anoints us to do. And then we tell everybody else that's what they're supposed to be doing. Don't ask me how long I pray. I ain't even going to tell you. I don't even know anymore. I pray a lot throughout the day. I don't, I don't know. I don't care. I'm not measuring things and counting things anymore. And I did so much of that. I got on a Read the Bible Through in a Year program, and you had to read six chapters a day to get through in a year. Two in Proverbs, two in Psalms, one in the old, one in the new. I forget now what the formula was. And I did okay for a few days, and I was getting check marks on my calendar. We got a calendar, and you got check marks. The flesh loves check marks. <laughs> Woo! I mean, we just get excited about check marks. And I put my calendar on the refrigerator, and really, the reason why I put it on the refrigerator, and I'm telling you the truth, I didn't really know all this stuff then because I didn't know how to be honest with myself, but I put it on there so everybody would see what I was doing. And as long as I was getting my check marks, I'd walk by that refrigerator and my flesh would just puff. I mean, how could you be any better praying four hours a day and reading the Bible through in a year?
Well, that worked for a little while, and then I started getting behind, and I was about 36 chapters behind, and so I had all these gaping holes on my calendar, so now then, when I walked by that stupid calendar, it would condemn me. I mean, it took me years to get over this, and finally God said, will you stop counting everything you do? David counted the people so he could feel good about himself, and he let a curse into the camp. Oh, I can defeat the enemy. Look at all the people I got. So you don't have to fear that you're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. And not only that, you'll never do enough. Jesus did enough. He did enough. So we do what we're led by the Spirit to do. We do what we're anointed to do, and we don't compare ourselves with other people because God anoints different people in different ways. Come on now. My time with God and my, my prayer time in the morning is it's like eating a spiritual breakfast. And I don't know how to explain this to you, but I can tell when I'm full. Sometimes I have to eat two hours. Sometimes 30 minutes, sometimes 45, but I can tell when I'm full. And when I feel full, I feel satisfied. I feel ready for the day. But I ain't going out of my house till I have my spiritual breakfast because I know that apart from Him, I can do nothing. I have weaknesses. I need His strength. I'm, imperfer I'm imperfect, so I need the perfect one working through me at all times. I don't need to count everything I do. I actually think that's offensive to God. Hmm. You know why? Because you feel good about yourself if you do a lot. And you feel bad about yourself if you don't. <laughs> now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having goals. You know, if you want to set a goal, I'm going to pray 30 minutes every day. That's fine. But don't pray in the flesh. Don't sit there and make yourself try to come up with something when you set everything that you need. I mean, if you set everything you need to and you want to do 30 minutes, then just sit there in God's presence and just say, here I am, God, the biggest mess in the universe. Help me. <laughs> come on, God wants honest communication, not a bunch of religious nonsense. Jesus didn't die so we could all have a religion. He died so we could have an intimate, personal, friendly relationship with Him. Intimacy. Life is real. Problems are real. Bring Jesus into your real life. Not just your church life, your real life. Hallelujah. Well, I'm kind of liking this. Let's look at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. This is a scripture that we use for salvation, but we need to apply this to every area of our life. For it is by free grace, God's unmerited favor, that you're saved, delivered from judgment and made a partaker of Christ's salvation through your faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, not of your own doing. It came not through your own striving, but it is the gift of God. Not because of works, not the fulfillment of the law's demands, lest any man should boast. It is not the result of what anyone can possibly do, so no one can pride himself in it or take glory to himself. And we need to live that way. Number five, the fear of being taken advantage of. Woo! I still deal with that one a little bit. God tells us to be humble and meek, but we're usually afraid that if we take that attitude, people are going to walk all over us. We're afraid that they're going to take advantage of us. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that in due time he may exalt you. Meekness is not weakness, we, but it's strength under control. I always had the attitude, you're not going to talk to me like that. You're not going to treat me like that. I didn't know how to wait on God to be my vindicator. 
I wanted to make sure that I took up for myself because I'd been mistreated in my life and I just kind of made a promise to myself, nobody's going to push me around again. You know, when you make those kind of inner vows, sometimes you have a, a, a hard time in relationships. You got to be careful of this kind of thinking. I'm afraid to trust people. You can't trust anyone. That's totally not true. But I will tell you this. You don't have to be afraid of people trying to take advantage of you. Some will. You don't have to be afraid of it at all. Someone will try from time to time. But God is your vindicator and he'll deal with those who try to misuse you. God will deal with it. You can't isolate yourself and refuse to be involved with anybody because you're afraid of being hurt. Love hurts. You can't love and never have pain. If you open yourself up to love, you're going to have some pain. But you give pain too. Mm -hmm, hello. Thank you for your encouragement. 2 Timothy 4.14 I want you to turn some things over to God tonight. Just turn them over to God. Alexander the coppersmith did me great wrongs, Paul said. The Lord will pay him back for his actions. <laughs> Man, I like that attitude. Boy, this guy really took advantage of me and mistreated me. You know, God spoke to my husband years ago and said something that's helped us in many situations in our life. He said, nobody can steal from you if you've got your trust in me. Because whatever they take from you, if you're a person of integrity, whatever they take from you, if I have to funnel it through a thousand people, I'll take it away from them and get it back to you. And so, Dave and I don't even get mad anymore. You know, if, if we have some kind of repair done and they didn't do it right, they won't come back out and fix it. I mean, we do, we do what we can to be aggressive, to try to get them to take their proper responsibility and fix it. But if they won't, we just say, well, not going to get upset. Turn it over to God. They can't steal from us. God, we trust you to bring it back to us. I want to encourage you to start doing that. People can't steal from you if you won't have that attitude. You can just say, God, they can't steal from me because you're going to take it away from them and get it back to me one way or the other. You're in charge of my vindication. You'll pay me back. Otherwise, you're going around mad all the time because people are not treating you right. People in the world aren't going to always treat us right, especially not the way the world is today. There's more people out there that don't keep their word, I think, than people who do. And it is difficult, and it is challenging. And I've had people that I would have never thought would have done certain things, do things that it just left me like. And the first thing that comes up in your mind, my mind too, is you just can't trust anybody. That's it, I'm not ever trusting anybody again. And the second thing I say is wrong. I'm not going to do that because it's not fair to put that off on other people. There are good people. There are great people, wonderful people who do keep their word that you can trust. Don't let the devil lie to you and put you in fear that everybody's going to take advantage of you. Number six, the fear of involvement. <laughs> you know, being involved with people is often messy. <laughs> and even disappointing. It's work to be involved with people. It means working through issues that come up due to our differences and our flaws. And sometimes it just becomes so much work, we just feel like we'd rather not mess with it. Thank you, I'll just do it myself. It means confrontation, and we would, most of us would rather not do that. We don't want to confront issues. We don't like to delegate things to other people, so we work ourselves to death, and we get burnout, and then we end up murmuring, grumbling, and complaining, because all we do is work all the time. And we won't delegate anything to anybody else, because we don't want to have to put up with their weaknesses.
They might not do it like we do it. Because after all, we're the only ones that can do anything right. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you something. I was about dead about six years ago from all the work that I had done in trying to build this ministry and do what I felt like God was calling me to do. And it was easier in the earlier years, but there's a saturation point that we come to. And I just started feeling like I just can't do this anymore. I mean, all I had done was work, 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 work. I mean, I've written 90 books. I didn't do that on vacation. Amen. And I'm not sorry. I want to leave a legacy to the body of Christ of 100 books. That's my goal. I want to leave those. I want people to be reading my books a long time after Jesus takes me home. Because some of the books that have impacted my life the absolute most are books that were written in the 16th, 17th century. So when the word is down on paper, it's there forever. Obviously, you can see from the size of the ministry and the amount of things that God's letting us do that it's taken a tremendous amount of work. And I remember a few years ago, I said to my husband, I said, you know what? I'm not going to work this hard anymore. I cannot do it anymore. If we have to downsize this ministry and make it smaller, I'm not going to do it. Well, just about that time, our, our youngest son, who's now 31, so that he was about 25 then, came back to work for us. He'd worked for us for a while and then was doing some other things, and then he came back to work for us. And, and I began to realize that God put him there to take a lot of the responsibility that I was taking. Our oldest son already worked for us, and he, he was over the world missions, but a lot of the stuff that I was handling was things with the TV and the radio. I mean, I not only did all this stuff, but then I got involved in all that stuff. And uh, so I finally knew that if I was ever going to have any rest or, or any joy or any peace, that I couldn't do all of it anymore. I couldn't do all of it anymore. And I'm sure some of you have been saying that. I can't do all of this anymore. <laughs> Has anybody been saying that? I cannot do all of this anymore. Well, I turned a whole, I just, Dave and I don't hardly ever get involved in running the office anymore. I mean, we know what's going on. We get involved when we need to. We stay on top of things. But I'm giving myself now to what I'm actually called to do. I can do a lot of the other things, but I'm not called to do those things. And just because you can do something doesn't mean you're supposed to be doing it. Or just because you did it for a certain number of years doesn't mean you're supposed to still be doing it. There are seasons in our lives, and we're supposed to turn things over to the next generation. Well, everything that they do is not what I would do. I see covers on some of our CD albums sometimes, and I think, well, I don't like that. <laughs> but you know what? It's not important enough for me to take it back over. And there's things like that that happen, you know, here and there. To be honest, I don't even pay that much attention anymore because the end result is great. God's blessing, the ministry's growing, people are being helped, and I don't have to like everything. And you don't have to like everything. We were in a board meeting, and I was still having trouble letting go of a lot of this stuff. You know, a lot of times we want to have somebody do the work, but we still want to tell them everything to do. <laughs> well, you can't give people responsibility if you don't give them authority. And as soon as you give them authority, then that means you got to back off and stay out of some stuff. You can't nitpick everything to death. And so we were talking about colors for the magazine, and they wanted to use some colors that I didn't like. I said, I don't like those colors. And my son said, well, some people do. I said, well, I don't. <laughs> he said, oh, excuse me. I didn't know you were called a minister to yourself. <laughs> Whoa.
Because I basically said, if I don't like it, it ain't going in print. Excuse me, I didn't know you were called a minister yourself. You know what? I needed it. And he's the only one that could have got by with saying it. <laughs> and he was absolutely right. I didn't have to like everything. Everybody's not like you. Everybody's not going to do everything the way you do it, but you can either go crazy or you can get some help. Come on now, I'm preaching better than you're acting. Let's look at Exodus 18 for just a moment. I want to show you something. This will get the point across. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you do for the people? Why do you sit alone? <laughs> it, it would be no different if I looked at you and said, why are you doing everything yourself? <laughs> why do you sit alone? Let's put the scripture back up. And all the people stand around from morning till evening. <laughs> Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me. <laughs> and they inquire of God. Well, sure, everybody wants me to do everything. Everybody wants to talk to me on the phone. Everybody wants me to do this. Everybody wants to do that. It's like, well, I can't, and I'm not going to. And everybody in your family, all your friends, the people that depend on you, they may be used to you doing everything, and they're going to say, well, you know, I need you to do it. Nobody does it like you. Now, now, now watch, look at Moses. When they have a dispute, they come to me. And I judge between a man and his neighbor, and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. You know, a lot of times we like that. Well, everybody comes to me, everybody comes to me. It makes me feel good when everybody comes to me. And Moses' father-in-law said, this thing that you're doing is not good. Now, let's look at the next thing. You will surely wear out both yourself and this people with you. And here's what happens. I believe that God surrounds every person with the people that they need to help them do what God's called them to do. Now, I believe that. And I can tell you, all the stuff that's going on through our ministry, I mean, to be honest with you, other than the preaching and the writing and the teaching and the praying, I have very little to do with any of it. Because God sent me people that could do the part that I couldn't do, but you've got to let them do it. And even in a family unit, God gives you what you need in that family unit. Some of you ladies are running everything, and you could just give your husband some of the stuff, but if you do, then you got to give him some authority with it. And <laughs> well, I just have to do all the work around here. <laughs> well, we don't have time for all that, do we? <laughs> How many of you are glad I don't have time to go there? You know, we want our husbands to be the spiritual head of the household till they become one and want to start taking some authority. Oh, just go back to your recliner. And <laughs> lay back and watch a little more TV. I thought I wanted you to pay the bills, but now that you're telling me what I can and can't spend, I'll take it back, thank you. <laughs> Whew, I tell you, this is so much fun tonight, I can't hardly stand it. Amen? You got some kids that could do some things, but, oh, they might not do it like you. <laughs> yeah. Moses' father-in-law said a wise thing. You're going to wear yourself out and the people. Do you know what happens to people when God puts somebody, say, in a church are in a corporation that he's gifted for certain things and nobody uses them. They get disgruntled and unhappy and they begin to murmur and complain and find fault with everything because God didn't create us for boredom. There's nothing worse than sitting back having to watch somebody try to do something that they're not nearly as good at as you are but they won't let you do it for fear that you might steal a little bit of their thunder or not do something exactly the way they would. You don't need to be afraid of getting hurt if you get involved. You will. 
No, you didn't like that much. <laughs> but you will survive and you will grow and you will learn and you will recover and you will have some help. You know, if you've been tormented by fear or held back from doing the things that you really want to do because of fear, I have good news for you today. Fear does not have to rule in your life anymore. You can face it head on. You can conquer it and find freedom in Christ to be able to do what God has called you to do. You can do it afraid. Well, this handsome little guy's name is David, and he's 12 days old. He was born two months early, and he weighs 1.6 kilos. You know, if it wasn't for this wonderful home here in Kampala, Uganda, that cares for orphan and abandoned children, he would not have made it. But because of the work that the people here are doing, and we're in partnership with them, many children are having an opportunity for a brand new life. So we just want to thank you for being involved. I think it's a great work. God bless you. You know, I don't think that we can underestimate the power of habits in our lives. First, we form habits, and eventually they form us. In my new book, Making Good Habits, Breaking Bad Habits, you'll discover that the freedom from bad habits lies in filling your life with one good habit after another. And with God's help, I believe you can put an end to struggling with bad habits and discover a new level of success in your life. Get my new book today. In this book vertelt Joyce how it aanleren van goede gewoonten je leven kan verbeteren. Nu ook verkrijgbaar op DVD en profiteer van de setkorting via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Joyce Meyer die is toch van TV? Wat doet ze nog meer? Ze schrijft boeken. Ik hou niet zo van lezen. Er zijn ook DVD's. En wat nog meer? Themaboekjes, mokken. Hé, hey, dat kan ik allemaal niet onthouden. Daarom is er de Joyce Meyer Info- en Productbroschure. Met een overzicht van alle boeken en DVD's. Had dat dan meteen gezegd? Die kan je online bekijken of bestellen. Kosteloos. Met alle informatie over de dagelijkse overdenkingen, Facebook, nieuwsbrief. Niet slecht. Bestel nu ook de Joyce Meyer Info- en Productbroschure. Via joyce-meyer.nl slash brochure of telefonisch via 026 2022 100. Super!